Hey, good evening to everybody. It's good to see you, and it is good to be seen by you. I am Bill Sylvie, the Dungeon Delver, and uh, welcome to this thing that we do. Welcome to the show, everybody. Normally, my co-host, Kyle, would be joining us tonight. Um, he, of course, is down in sunny Australia having uh, some time with his kids as they are on a school break as it is my understanding. Now, let me just address the awesomeness in the room. Uncle Brat, thank you so much for that extremely generous super. That is that is just fantastic. And uh, who will match him? <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. I, 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 I really do. That is, that is stellar. Um, uh, and... And, and, you know, it, it helps keep the lights on around here, folks. It really does. So we've got a good show for you tonight. We're going to be doing a deep dive into uh, a pretty well-regarded dungeon module. This is actually, uh, we're going to be taking a look at The Secret of Bone Hill, which I myself have not... Um, I myself have not taken a look at in a long while. Hey, there's Ryan David, everybody. By the way, uh, are you subscribed to Nerd Cognito on YouTube? You should be, because uh, they have an awesome live stream they do on Saturdays called The Speakeasy. They have an incredible podcast that drops on, uh, I think it's the first of the week, right, Ryan? Um, and speaking of Ryan David, he has just released a module. Well, I say just released. It's been a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, that is awesome. It, it, it's for all D&Ds, but you should definitely check it out because it has a great old school groove to it. I've already picked out where it's going in my world of Greyhawk Tuesdays. Thank you. My brain wanted to say Monday, but I knew that wasn't right. So it's Tuesdays. They have their, uh, their podcast drop. Um, and you, you can find all the cool links over at uh, Nerd Cognito on YouTube. But um, I got some copies of that. Ryan donated some copies of that. Next Tuesday is my birthday live stream. I'm going to be giving out copies of Green Haven PDF. You'll you'll be d d you'll be directed to download it. Uh, I don't I don't think it's on Pod yet. Is it uh, Is it Ryan? But anyway. Uh, but you should check it out. It's worth your time. It's worth your money. Um, but anyway, so we're going to have some, some, uh, fun, uh, meteor key press. Happy Wednesday to you too. Uh, we have a guest tomorrow, guys. We have a guest tomorrow, Tim Imholt, who is a, a speculative fiction writer is going to, um, uh, going to be here and we're going to talk espionage. We're going to, we're going to talk about ye old Jack Ryan and stuff like that. So if top secrets, your jam, uh, and things related, espionage related, you'll want to tune in. And, uh, Tim's going to tell us about his, his writing projects and stuff he's done and stuff he's got coming up. And, um, all sorts of cool things. But anyway, we have got a good show tonight. Secret of Bone Hill. We, we have not done proper old school D&D content on this channel, I think, in far too long. So we're going to start up uh, Secret of Bone Hill tonight. Now, I really like to roll up my sleeves and dive deep into these modules and look at encounters and illustrations and everything else. So... I doubt seriously we're going to cover the whole module in an hour. Um, so let's, uh, you know what? Let's let's just get into it, and uh, we'll we'll take a, you know we'll take a tour through the beginning of Len Lakafka's Lendor Isles saga, shall we? Um, but just before we do, of course, I want to remind every. Buddy, that this live stream is brought to you by our friends at Hellebard Games. Hellebard makes the kind of adventures that they'd like to play, whether it's for Castles and Crusades, for 5e, or for the OSR 
Old School is in play at the table with Hella Bar Games, and you can find them on DriveThruRPG or on their website, hellabardgames.com. So uh, let's let's get cracking on this. Now I'm going to do the, let's see, I think probably the easiest way to do this is just the present tool. Um, so let's see, it's not that one. So to present, share screen. Okay, we're going to, uh, nope, that's not it. There we go. Okay. All right. So let's take a gander at this module. And I got all my old tabs from uh, from from the other game sessions are still open up there. I guess we can close keep on the Borderlands finally. Uh. But anyway, well, Mark, you know, I mean, uh, it, it depends. You know, it it, it depends. But anyway, we start off here. Uh, first of all, I love this color. I love this color composition. This is an amazing, just a, an absolutely glorious piece by Bill Willingham. We have a um, <clears throat> nicely endowed magic user who is throwing some lightning at an unfortunate victim there. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece. So let's uh, let's let's take a look. What does the cover blurb tell us? Danger lurks in the Lindor Isles. Bands of evil creatures prowl the hills overlooking the town of Restonford, seeking unwary victims. Now you have come to this sleepy little village looking for adventure and excitement. You seek to fathom the unexplored reaches of Bone Hill and unlock the mysteries of Restonford. This module contains complete information on the town of Restonford and the land surrounding it. Included herein are encounter tables, background information, and numerous maps of the town, the surrounding areas, a dungeon, and various points of interest. This module may be incorporated into an existing campaign or used in conjunction with the world of Greyhawk fantasy world setting. If you enjoy this module, look for other TSR products and watch for future releases from the Game Wizards. And this particular edition I've got here is uh, a 1981 release, although as you can see from the Moonface logo down there, this is uh, a uh, this is a the, the 1980 uh, logo there. And as it says, first of a campaign series. Now, um, apparently my sources tell me that Gary was so taken with, uh, L1 after reading it, he wanted to put it immediately in the, uh, in the world of Greyhawk. So it gets that right on the cover. Now there's something interesting about this and I want to check this out. The cover, uh, kind of gives us a little bit of information. Note, note the level range. Right there. That is, it's not one to three like you see on uh, Village of Homlet, Keep on the Borderlands, In Search of the Unknown. It's for character levels two to four. So it's it, it, it's kind of got a half beat ahead of starter modules. So you know you could run a party through a couple of short adventures and then level them up. But it's really calling for a higher leveled party than you might normally, um, you know, uh, encounter. Hey, hey, Tonka Todd, good to see you, my friend. So let's let's get into it and let's find out what's going on here. Sadly, as we depart this gorgeous, uh, gorgeous artwork. So immediately you can see we have, um, uh, we have our non-repro blue map with our 10 by 10 squares. Uh, we got a lovely key there. We have the Bone Hill, the castle ruins. And as I always say, everybody, you know, I don't care how badly written a module is. Generally speaking, at the very least, you can get a map out of it. 
Um, oh, Luther, don't even, man, don't even. All right, so let's continue here. And we got another wonderful piece here. Uh, yes, that is Bill Willingham. By the way, in case if you're if you're looking to purchase a copy of this, this is available pod uh, and um, PDF on drive through. Uh, the PDF's only t- like two forty nine, two ninety nine, something like that. I scooped it up um, just this evening. I will warn you: this download is like a hundred and twenty nine megs. I don't know what the 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 folks over at drive through did with this scan. But it's, man, it is, it is rough. It is rough. So anyway, uh, we have some, uh, some beautiful Willingham art. We have a repeat of the cover blurb. And let us continue. And we get to our background. Always very important. Dungeon Masters. Dungeon Masters. Read the modules before you run them. I I always try to teach AD&D on this live stream. And so the lesson I give to you, nascent dungeon masters, please, 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 please read the module before you run it. Don't just rip the the cellophane off or take your uh, your your pod copy out of the mailbox or pull up your PDF on your mobile device at the table and jump into it. Particularly not this one. All right, but let's continue. The adventures in this module take place in or near the town of Restonford, a fishing port on the Isle of Lindor's south. Uh, I'm sorry, southernmost peninsula. The entire island is not depicted in the maps in this module, but all pertinent features are detailed. Lindor Isles is covered with vegetation of all kinds and enjoys a mild climate varying from semi-tropical warmth in the north, heated by prevailing warm water currents, to a more temperate and seasonal south. The island, as are all spindrift in the spindrift chains, is populated by scattered communities of humans, demi-humans, and humanoids. Notes for the Dungeon Master. This module is designed for novice and intermediate level players. The number of player characters should be between 2 and 8. The recommended level of character experiences from 2nd to 4th. Magic items available to the party at the start of the adventure should likewise be restricted. Players may either bring in existing characters of the appropriate level with DM's approval, roll up new characters as suggested in Appendix P of the Dungeon Master's Guide, or the DM may wish to the party of pre-rolled characters included at the end of this module. Another handy thing, and I got to tell you something. Um, w- many is the time when you may find yourself as a DM and you roll that encounter with adventuring party in a dungeon. Don't fret, don't sweat, don't try and hand wave it. Just grab a classic module that has pre-gens in it. And there's the party of adventures. Unless, of course, that's the same module that you're running your party through. And they've played those characters before. Or maybe you want to introduce chaos and do that anyway. Also, I would point out that um, it says roll up new characters as suggested in Appendix P. Now, we've looked at Appendix P before. And what's interesting about this We'll just zip down there real quick. Um, Are we on? Half a moment. Let's just take a quick look here. Appendices. Okay. Appendix P is creating a party on the spur of a moment. And what's what's important about this particular appendix is there is a chance that you're 
even a first level party, well, second, they'd be a second level party, but um, they could be, they could be carrying some magical firepower. Like for example, cleric at second level per this chart has a 20% chance of having a shield of plus one, at least a 10% chance for magic plate and so on down the line, rings of protection, scrolls, and magic weapons, potions, and possibly miscellaneous items. And so they're kind of putting us in there and saying, hey, here's a place where you can use Appendix P. So let's kind of continue on here. Uh, a random encounter chart is given below that can easily apply to any large sections of the aisle. All monsters encountered are considered passersby and are not inhabitants of the specific area being investigated. Uh, so you wouldn't roll for lair. You wouldn't roll percent in lair on these. This chart is applicable to most encounters on open grassland and forests or on smaller hills. Some forests and many mountains have specific populations that will be described in addition to any encounters. The chance for a random encounter is one in six. A check should be made three times per day and once each night. So that's a total of four as the adventure. And let's take a look at what we've got. Sturges. Sturges are bad news for a low level party, guys. I mean, yeah, they're only one plus one hit dice and they only drain one to four hit points of damage, but guess what? That could fell a second level character like that. Moreover, they attack as four hit dice monsters. So Len's not messing around, but then the odds you're going to encounter them are only one in 20. Then you've got wolves, wargs, uh, giant worker ants, axe beak, onk egg, onk eggs. Yikes! Onk eggs are bad news for a higher level party. Carnivorous apes, same. Giant bombardier beetles, giant centipedes, giant rats. A uh, couple of different kinds of snakes, giant spider, halflings. That's good. So, you know, you could run into some halflings, elves, or dwarves. But generally speaking, if you look at the bell curve, you're going to be hitting um, rats and snakes. Um, but, uh, halflings, elves, dwarves, gnomes, and then bandits or brigands hope for bandits. They're neutral human or demi human bands of five or more individuals will be led by a leader of two to fifth level ability. An elvish leader will be a fighter magic user of matching levels. So we have some rumors and facts. Um, the following is a list is a compilation of various stories, rumors, and facts concerning Restonford and the surrounding area. Any resident of the area might know one or more of these tales. Some of them are absolutely true. Some are partially true and others are utterly false. Those that are partially true will have the false statements italicized. Men at arms, peasants, and level zero fighters will not know any of these tales. Only individuals with one or more levels will know any of these stories. I kind of don't agree with that. All right. The peasantry is always going to gossip and their tales are going to be even wilder than something a quote unquote seasoned adventurer might bring to the table. So I don't know. I might give this to everybody. So we've got uh, character level and then a percentage chance that they'll know a given number of rumors. So let's look at those rumors. The Baron of Restonford is really chaotic evil. So the evil part's uh, not untrue. The Baroness is a lawful good cleric. The Baronet is an illusionist who wants, who wants the throne of Restonford. One of the guards at the castle Restonford is a spy for an evil band of outlaws. Totally untrue. It's false. No way. Not this time. We created it. Not this time. Sorry. I just saw an opportunity and I seized it. Uh, let's see. So we've got uh, 
the captain of the guard of the garrison in Restonford has a magic horn that can cause walls to collapse. The Baron of Restonford is land poor and his family is nearly penniless. The Baron has it hidden all has has it all hidden under his castle. There is an unguarded fortune down there somewhere. Uh, let's see. The magic user who calls himself a sorcerer is only an enchanter. The Baron owns a statue that turns into a man. It's a man, baby. Uh, basically, Drew. The town has some evil people in it, no matter what the Baron says. Falco's Tavern is run by two assassins. One or more of the clerics at the Abbey is really an, really an evil devil worshiper. So it's all true except for the devil worshiper part. Uh, are they evil demon worshippers? The sorcerer has a number of magic users working for him. There's a mercenary in Restonford. I think he's one of the guards. The warehouse guard dropped a dread a few days ago during a scuffle in the inn with two half orcs, but I saw him that very night, and the half orcs were found burned to death at the edge of town. I love it. A child was one, was bitten by a giant rat a few days ago near the crossroad by the abbey. I've seen things moving around the old guardhouse you people wouldn't believe. Sorry, I've seen things moving around uh, by the old guardhouse down by the river. They looked like shadows. I know you won't believe this. But some months ago, I was down by that old guardhouse and I saw a skeleton walking. What's worse, he spoke out loud. The cleric on the hill is an honorable man. Go to him for help. Bone Hill is occupied by huge orcs. Beware. They don't call it the dead forest for nothing. I heard there's a ghost on Bone Hill. There is a ruin on top of Bone Hill. It is abandoned. Perhaps there's lost treasure there. One night I was coming through Kelman Pass when I saw a woman on horseback ride by into the dead forest. Her horse's hooves were on fire. By the way, if anyone wants to hear any of these as Alex Jones, drop a super. We're running out. So, you know, I, got, I kind of played myself there. But if anybody wants to hear uh, the, the Alex Jones rumor table, drop a super. Uh, let's see. A band of evil gnomes lives in the Dwemer forest. I have seen a high priest come to town from time to time, though I have not met him. They say he has a church somewhere within a dozen or so miles of town. There is another druid other than the one in Restonford in one of the forests near Restonford. Our party was attacked by orcs as we crossed the bridge over the Reston River. Lark Hill is a haven for bandits. High Top is a common campground for men of the wilderness. There's a pack of wolves to all right. <clears throat> Let's see where where was. There's a pack of wolves just outside the town to the south. They're the pets of some evil giant. I tried to warn you, people. I tried to tell you about this. It's all prophesized. They don't want you to know about it. They're trying to hide the truth from you. There you go, Vaughn. Uh, let's see. Colloidal silver. Uh, let's see. A tribe of hill giants lives somewhere in the Pebble Hills. 
I couldn't believe my eyes. There he was, a giant with two heads. I saw him drinking by the lake near Spring Glade. And finally, the Pebble Hills are a perfectly safe place to make camp outside of Restonford. All right, so there we have... That is an extensive... I, my hat, I doff my hat to the late Lynn Lakofka. That is a that is a good... I love a good rumor table in a module, and that is a good one. No, Orbital... You got it. You know, you you, you got to you got to show some green to get the Walkeen. The wilderness. Each outdoor location is formatted to make finding necessary information easy and fast. The material is laid out as follows, and I got to say, I do like the um, I I, I do like how this kind of oh hello David McCauley, good to see you. How um, this module is less handholdy than, say, Keep on the Borderlands, but as it starts with second level characters, it assumes that you as a DM have got a lot of good stuff down, but may just maybe you still need a little bit of help. It's good stuff, you know. Uh, so let's see. So the, it goes location name, feature inhabitants, major inhabitants, encounter chances, action, and roster detail. And of course, you know, that, that should be, that, 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 that should be fairly self-explanatory. Uh, I think, you know, Roster detail is basically it's armor class hit points. It's stat block. So we've got the Dwemer Forest first. It's oak, beech, elm, and ash with a few laurel leaf trees. I extend to you a laurel and hearty handshake. Um, on the southern border, herbaceous life is plentiful, Pla paths seem natural and not man-made. In the center of the forest, roughly a circle of one mile diameter, the trees change to walnut, maple, cherry, and apple. I'm getting hungry over here. Len's got, Len has got dessert laid out in the module. <laughs> may, <laughs> may, may, maybe the Lindor Isles are all <laughs> dessert aisles. <laughs> Oh, mercy. Uh, flowers are also very abundant. A small knoll, excuse me, a small knoll can be seen at the head of this clump of trees. The knoll is treeless, but there are numerous bushes in spring and fall. These bear a small pale green flower. In summer and winter, a dark green berry. If the berries are eaten, the person will be violently sick for two to seven days. Delicious tea or horrible poison. Thumbs up to you if you got that reference. Um, if the forest is entered during the winter in the circle and no, uh, these, this circle and no will be found to always stay above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, even if snow is falling elsewhere. It's global warming, people. It's weather control. Lindor Isle is hiding weather control. Uh, let's see. The knoll is about a thousand feet in diameter and rises 60 feet above the forest floor. It's dome shaped and the top, it can be seen another small dome that is in the shape of an egg cut lengthwise, about 40 feet tall and 60 feet in diameter. At the forest edge, numerous small animals can be seen. Alone falcons, small birds of many types, squirrels, hares, raccoons, and foxes. In the inner circle, animal life is quite dense. Atop the knoll is the Church of the Big Gamble. Administering its services are a 10th level high priest, a 9th level high priestess, and five 4th level assistant clergy. These individuals are detailed below. Remember, this is two to four. Your party gets mouthy. They're, they're gonna, yeah. Yeah. 
encounter probabilities, a hundred percent to observe, uh, uh, birds and animals, it's 40% likely that such an animal, including the foxes, falcon, or raccoons, will come to the party and beg for food. This chance increases to 90 if the party percent, uh, if the party, 90% if the party makes camp. On the hill itself is 35% likely that a party member will see one of the clerics. If the church has entered, the probability increases to 100%. I would hope so. Let us continue. The animals will warn the high priestess as soon as someone enters the forest. There will not be a hostile reaction by the clergy if no harm is done to the animals on the hill itself. <laughs> you punt a raccoon at your own uh, at your own peril. Picking flowers or taking berries in moderation is acceptable. The interaction of the clergy and the service of the church is explained hereafter. Roster detail. Faldelac. Which, if you know your Wisconsin, there there's a Fond du Lac up there. So I wonder if that's a little kind of reference to that. Uh, he's a high priest cleric, tenth level, fifty eight hit points, bracers of defense, AC three, ring of free action, spell of spell, ring of spell turning, an amulet of inescapable location, and a staff of striking with thirty four charges. And he has all the spells. Cure light wounds, bless, remove, uh, fear, light, chant, find, trap, speak with animals, no alignment, hold person, silence, 15 foot radius, augury, animate, dead, continual light, cause blindness, bestow curse, detect lie, protection from evil, 10 foot radius, cure serious wounds, neutralize poison, commune, uh, and dispel evil. That's a lot. Right? That raccoon does have one. Let's see. He's 45 years old, 5 foot 8, 100 pounds, brown hair and beard, brown eyes. He's very short-tempered and will not tolerate an insult or ob obnoxious behavior. Don't call him a manlet. T there's two rules up there, guys. Don't punt a raccoon. Don't call don't call fall to lack a manlet. Um he will quickly act to remove undesirable adventurers from the forest and will initiate such action at a time when the party is most unaware. I will initiate self-destruct. <laughs> a ring of anti-magic. It never worked, which <laughs> I think means it worked. <laughs> ah, that's interesting, Orbital Lair. Um, uh, Sapphire uh, Connect One uh, had a lot to do with that uh, event. Uh, Auburn, boo, boo. Sorry, that's a college football joke. High Priestess, Cleric, uh, ninth level, 43 hit points. Uh, those stats. She wears leather armor plus one and a shield plus three and carries a mace plus three. She can use the following spells, detect evil, detect magic, light, bless, cure light wounds, command, chant, find traps, hold person, augury, speak with animals, no alignment, cure blindness, cure disease, feign death, remove curse, sticks to snakes and detect lie and flame strike. She's 38 years old, 5'3", 110 pounds, with long brown hair and brown eyes. She enjoys long walks on the beach and conversation about philosophy and classic rock music. The remaining five clerics are only briefly sketched below. One might be sent along to see that a quest or mission is faithfully discharged. Now, it doesn't launch much into Auburn's personality, so I think that's probably best left up to the... Uh, up to the... Um, the dungeon master, as far as what her attitude is, I would imagine it would probably go along with uh, fall to lack, you know, uh, no raccoon punting, no taking excessive berries, no ogling her. And uh, she's charisma 17. So, you know, th there's the possibility. Uh, so we have these clerics posted. Yes, that's there. That's the cleric's name. Uh, Qual, Myla, Yella, Telmar. Uh, 
The egg-shaped building stands 40 by 60 by 18. It has six windows of one-way glass steel. The door is made of solid stone, and when it closes, it locks via special enchantment, which is not affected by knock spells. A dispel magic will destroy the enchantment, leaving the huge stone door in place, however. Inside are three rooms, an outer service room taking up half of the building, and two smaller back rooms, uh, which have doors uh, opening into the main room. Rectory hell, it liked to kill them. Uh, yeah, no perfects. <laughs> no perfects. Uh, in the service room, there's a dais of seven steps. And on top of that, there's a lectern. Resting on the lectern is a closed book. The back of the lectern is covered by a drape. Neither the book nor the lectern can be reached without standing on the dais. There are four three-foot square tables arranged in a square around the dais. Top view of the configuration is like the pips on a D6 when a five is rolled. Each table has four square stone benches around it. Stepping on the dais automatically closes and locks the door. A bell will ring in the back rooms, and the clergy will come for a service after a pause of two to eight rounds. Naturally, they will fight if attacked using their most powerful spells. If the book is taken off the dais, a loud scream will be heard, and the clergy will rush out even if they are not fully armed or armored. You know, this is such a lovely place. I think I'll take a look at their holy book, Shriek. Uh, if not attacked, the clergy will invite the party to take seats at the table and sit amongst the party after going to the high priest at the lectern and receiving from him a leather cup containing two ivory and jade percentile dice. The party will be asked to split up so that at least one party member and one cleric can be at each table. The high priest will then call upon the high priestess to aid him. They will then produce a pitcher of wine and fill as many of the small wooden cups, there are 20 in all, as he needs for each person present, including himself and the high priestess. The wine is produced from the bushes that have the green berries flowers and produce a state of mild intoxication after imbibing just one small cupful. After each person is imbibed, the high priest will read from the scripture, O master of lots, bring the divine intervention in, in my behalf this day. Praise to thee those who control the destiny of wagers. Or, O God of chance, may your prayers as you see fit, uh, or may the dodecahedrons of fate come up not, not, etc. Add prayers as you see fit. The pitcher itself is worth 200. The dice are 100 per pair. While the word is being read, the clerics will engage the party in gambling. A stake of one GP must be put into the pot. The limit is five. Three rounds of rolls will then occur. High roll wins. Ties double the pot. Each winner at a table, if more than one exists, will roll off against the other winners at his or her table until a single winner, one per table, will take all of his or her winnings to one of the tables. All must bet, and those who are short must make up the difference or drop out, giving half to the church. And let's see. Um, each winner rolls once to see who wins it all and will then gamble against the high priest. You have a little illo there. Not sure who brought the art on that one. So the temple is an important site to the party. I, it may seem kind of goofy, but it is actually important to the party. Um, they'll help those who aren't greedy and don't try and turn the temple into a hostel. Not, not hostile, hostile. <laughs> Particularly not like the movie. The clerics are an excellent source of information about Bone Hill, and they can warn the party about it. They believe there are some, uh, they believe some undead are there, but they do not know the types or numbers. They might lay a quest upon the party who offend uh, upon a party who offends them in some way. Coming back to the church too often is twenty percent likely per return trip to upset the high priest, possibly to destroy the monsters on the hill. They will expect the choice of the second best item gained by the party when the quest is fulfilled. The high priest will use detect lie at the same time of questioning to be sure he's getting his choice from the spoils. Although, to be honest, if you lay a quest on him, you don't have to hit him with a detect lie. If the quest is go destroy the undead and then give me the second best magic item you find, then they have to do it. They're bound to do it. So they don't have to use detect lie. 
Zach asked, where should you start in uh, one first and say, um, Zach, I just get the core three books for first edition AD and D get a player's handbook, a dungeon master's guide and a monster manual. And we have a whole run of videos on the channel, how to play first edition AD&D, how to dungeon master first edition AD&D. And I, it, you can watch those, read along, pause the videos, make notes, do whatever you see fit. Now, if you're talking about playing, um, you might have to start a group and get your group comfortable with playing and then sort of pass the pass the torch on to somebody, you know, it's like, okay, it's your turn to DM now. I would, uh, th those are places I'd start, Zach. So anyway, the temple has a storeroom for valuables beneath the high priest and priestess room. They'd only know the words to deactivate the two glyphs of warding placed on the door. They'll inflict 6 to 36 points of electrical damage to any meddler, save versus spells for half damage. So you could potentially just get a nasty shock. But, I mean, odds are you're going to take 9 points of damage if you fart around with it. The temple treasure contains 405 platinum, 1,304 gold, 880 electrum, 2,309 silver, and no copper. <laughs> uh, 450... GP gems, 675, 8, 100, 9, 250, 3, 500, and 2, 1,000. That's awesome. Same three dot. Well, I mean, my heart belongs to first edition, but I, I started technically with Holmes basic, but not really. I've told that story before. All right. The church might buy a magic item at it at 20% below normal value if it is useful to someone in the temple. Once friendly contact's been made, the clergy might be willing to sell the bestowal of some spells. These spells, the cost and usage are dispel magic at 850, neutralize poison at 2300, cure light wounds at 130, cure serious wounds at 400, commune at 3500, and cure disease at 1500. Bargaining for a lower price will not be successful. Money talks BS walks in this temple. Um, let's see. This is the best the party can hope for in the way of aid on their adventures in this area. If they attack this place, the DM must be ruthless. Absolutely 100%. I mean, it's a 10th level cleric. Your party's average third level. You know, it's a dog fall for the cleric and, and the high priestess. Or the, the the high priest and the high priestess. I'm not stuck either, Orbital Air. Have you seen the shelves of games around me? I mean, I know it's just thumbnail now. But I know what I like. So, Bald Hill. Bald Hill. It's covered by small plants of various types. It's not bald. False advertising, TSR. Uh, it's covered with small plants of various types, but trees are solitary and rare. The crest of the hill, nearly one and a half miles by one mile, is dome-shaped and has virtually no vegetation. I take it back. The land around the crest and down towards the roads and town of Restonford is quite rich. Crops of various types are planted at the base of Ball Hill up to the edge of the town. The most common crops are rice, soybeans, some wheat, and numerous small crops and spices. Uh, only small animals dwell here. Brown rats and snakes are quite common, as well as many species of birds. Two small orchards of cherry and apple trees also contain small mammals. A small band of thieves occasionally occupies a cave on the northern face of the hill in the direction of Zerbal Mountains. So in the fields during the day, there's an 85% chance of encountering 3 to 12 persons of various ages tending to the crops in some way. But at night, there's only 5%. Randomly select them from the uh, Restonford homes. Uh, L through Z, 18 choices. Roll 3d6. 
or the Druid, number 35, or the Sellers of Fresh Food, number 29. Encounters in the fields will rarely be eventful. Remember that the farmers have little, if any, useful information. Small animals and birds are common in the field. The chances are 40% uh, for 2 to 5 at night, 60% for 2 to 7 during the day. The Band of Thieves is 50% likely to be present in their caves. If that percent is rolled, they will likely take up an ambush position near the bridge of the East Reston River in the forest or on either side of the road or near the road lane near the northeast out of town. The chances for laying the ambush in the forest is 75%. Along the northeast roads, 25%. A band will consist of two to five thieves. And then we have their roster. It talks about their rail, uh, their lair, uh, and the, let's see. They're led by two half-orc leaders, Krellis, half-orc fighter cleric. Uh, he is fifth level. That's quite the nut for a party to crack. Um, have fun, Michael Dale. That's awesome. Sounds like a lovely evening. And then you have Gorharg. Oh, and by the way, that, that he is rocking some spells. He's got a couple of old persons. Cure light wounds, curse, cure, uh, curse, detect magic protection from good. I don't know what he's robbing people for. He's loaded. And then the half-orc thief, leather armor plus one, a longsword plus one, and a dagger plus one. And then there's eight orcs. Yeah, I was going to say these are more like uh, these are more like brigands. In the bald hill hill lair, there's a small stash of eighty four gold, one hundred twenty electrum, three hundred thirty silver. It's hidden behind a loose rock in the cave, treat as a concealed door. They have a second lair in the Zerbal Mountains, a small stone building, twenty by thirty, with no windows, but with two iron reinforced doors. Some treasures in the half orcs room, in a chest trapped with a poison needle, save us a poison or die. Inside are 18 platinum, 104 gold, 134 EP, 1350 silver, and some gems, four times 100 and two times 200. They have a short sword plus one, a scroll of dimension door, and a potion of gaseous form. Now, here's the thing. I, as a DM, my temptation is to distribute those to, um, you know, uh, the... The scroll of Dimension Door is magic user. It's not usable by them. But I would say Gorhag has probably got that short sword and that potion of gaseous form on him. You know? Like, he's keeping that gaseous form in the case things really go south. He can get out of there. Three Dot says, I like the hold me spell. Uh, it forces the target to embrace and soothe my character. You laugh, but the NPC class, the witch, man, they, they could make you do that. So, um, you know what? Let's let's go down a little. We, we do this thing where we look at the maps. Let's, let's take a look at this a little bit to kind of get an idea. The Zerbal Mountains over there, Bald Hill. Here, let's... Uh... No, good Lord. Okay, so let's, let's kind of get a, a view of the land here in the last 10 or so minutes we've got this evening. And guys, we're going to do the whole module. We're, we're going we're gonna to cover this. Um... The first D and D topo map I saw was uh, the uh, Keep on the Borderlands one, but yeah, I mean, they didn't treat us too much like kids. They taught us to, how to read topographic maps back in the day. So you can see here we're kind of getting an idea. Um, but right here we have the aforementioned Bald Hill where the bad guys are, you know, their lair, 
looks over towards Zerbal Mountains here. The aforementioned Dwemer Forest. Lark Hill. And anything else? Oh, that's Dungeon. We don't want to give that away too soon. And here's Rustin Ford. Let's see. Nope, that's... Oh, dear. Sorry about that. Hope I'm not making anyone seasick. So there's Reston Ford itself. I am always a fan of town maps, as I've stated before. Um, so here's Reston Ford proper. But let's scroll back up now that we've kind of looked at that. Where were we? Oh, we're talking about dungeons already. This is going to be a fun read, guys. I'm going to enjoy the heck out of going down this with you. Going down through this with you, rather. All right, so Guardian Peak, Lark Hill, High Top, Low Point, Ready Forest. Helen, Ready Forest. Uh, these sites are often used as campgrounds by travelers, and for the purpose of this module, they will be sites for special encounters. Four NPCs are given here, and others may also be added if the DM sees fit. Uh, other hills and forests may be added to this list if the DM desires. When each of these locations is climbed or entered, roll percentile dice and use the random encounter table given. However, if 68 to double nuts is rolled, ignore the given result and substitute one of the NPC encounters listed under roster detail. Well, let's take a look at it. Because, uh, you know, it's a hill. Uh, the hills and depressions uh, are all grass covered with bushes and rock outcroppings every 50 to 300 feet. Uh, small stands of trees are quite common. The larger copses are shown on the map. The ready forest is typical of the area. Herbaceous plants are common and thick. A stand of walnut trees occupies most of the base of low point. Uh, so let's take a look at the roster detail. Tolvar, Conjurer, Magic User, third level. Uh, Bracers of Defense AC9, Ring of Protection plus one, a dagger, and his spell book. He has 110 EP. He has Sleep, Charm Person, and Invisibility. He also has Read Magic. I don't know if he has right, but I promise you he has Read Magic. You can't be a Magic User and not have Read Magic. He's an adventurer down on his luck. For a good offer, he will become a henchman. Lucinda, half-orc female cut purse swordsman. She's a third-level fighter thief of chaotic neutral demeanor. She wears leather armor and carries a broadsword plus one. Broadsword. Fire of wrath. Big ups to you if you got that one, too. He does not have Charm Person. Uh, she can be hired for an expedition. She's, a, she's an adventurous who recently arrived on the island. Martin Strider, Ranger. He's second level, 27 hit points, nice and tanky. He wears chain mail and wields a broad sewed plus one. He's a potential henchman. He's on no special mission. However, he's easily offended and expects people to take him at his word. Those who insist on using detect lie, no alignment, detect good or evil spells, etc., will alienate him at once. He's quite poor, only having one platinum and 13 electrum. Volsifar, Waghalter Assassin. And he is evil. He wears leather armor and a ring of protection plus one, carries a broad sword, a sling of seeking, dagger of venom, and a ring of spell storing containing and permanently set to hold, mask alignment, reversed no alignment, and dispel magic. Actually, it's obscure alignment is the spell. 
The ring must be empty before it can be filled again. He's lawful evil, but will pass himself off as lawful neutral. He will submit to detect evil, masking the attempt, but not to no alignment. He will say that the particulars of his philosophy are his business, but that he is not evil. He is very unlikely to murder a party member, even for a quick gain, but if an animosity builds up between a player character and himself, he might then try to do in him or her. If the player saves his life in a direct manner, he will be loyal as he is highly lawful. Remember that he has at least that he has first level thieving abilities, though he will pass himself off as a second level thief. If the party has too many characters of good alignment, especially chaotic good, he will likely drift away after an adventure, perhaps taking a good item with him. He carries 84 electrum and 10 gold. So these are all guys you could potentially add to your party for some good. And a note for the DM here, it's recommended that whenever a henchman is added to the party, that the dungeon master not simply rattle off the character's statistics, magic items, and other abilities. Good advice, regardless of what module you're playing. Tell them what they look like physically, and that's it. They don't know that sword's magic until they draw it. They don't know this guy's an assassin until he assassinates, you know. Um, a henchman will tell his or her boss about him or herself, but will not lay out his or her life for a perfect stranger. Once a few adventures have occurred, he will be freer with information about himself or herself. Obviously, this is more true of a hireling. The DM must not let the party know more than what is reasonable. If a player is given a character to portray, the DM must have the final veto over any action of the hireling or henchman. The DM must tell the player character what he or she needs to know to portray the character, but reserve the right to release data on that individual as necessary. I don't know that I agree with that. In fact, I disagree with that. If I told someone, hey, yeah, you can play Tolvar the Conjurer, I would hand you the sheet. And assuming you were an experienced D&D player, expect you to roll with it as you saw fit. But I'm not going to say, ah, 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 you don't tell them that. Even if it's an aside, you know. I think it's up to the player to play the characters they want. I find that a little bit railroady. I don't recommend you do that. Don't do that. Then we go into description of the uh, Pebble Hills, Tritop, Kelman Woods, Spring Glade. Uh, this part of the Kelman Hills is occupied by a band of gnolls and a pack of wolves. So we get a description of what the features are like. They're quite rocky, and boulders uh, uh, are very common, naturally. Grasses grow in clumps, as do bushes. Large sections of the hills are sandy or rocky with no plant growth. Uh, the few small copses of trees are normal forests with abundant bushes. The Kelman Woods is a typical forest, but evergreens, oaks, and laurels are thick along the coast and common up to a half mile into the forest. Spring Glade is quite luxurious. It is partially watered by the large lake, which is fed by underground streams running from the hills. The trees are very large and old, some standing over 100 feet tall. Herbaceous growth is not as thick as in some of the forests of the southern peninsula, but mosses are very common and thick. And we have random encounters for principal encounter uh, for um, principal inhabitants. Only uh, on a one in 10 will indicate an encounter. The Knoll Band is made up of six adult males, three adult females, and 11 children. There's also a wolf pack of three warg leaders, nine dire wolves, and a dozen young cubs. Mess with this bunch at your peril. The Knolls have a lair in the valley among the peaks of Tritop. It is a small town of six stone huts. I call it more hamlet than a town, but whatever. The wolf pack has a lair in the Kelman Woods, uh, at the very base of the tritop, within 200 feet of the wood's edge. You must be like the wolf pack, not the six pack. For small animals, encounter probabilities 10%, and there's a chance of an encounter from the random encounter table according to the party's location and using the table below. 
Consider the chance of the encounter to be equal at day or night, though the DM might wish to change the given percentage changes. And then we've got various locations and their possibilities. So that is that is our first brush there. We've got a lot to get into. Dungeons, people in the town, all kinds of... Are you guys excited for this? I hope you are. I hope you guys are, are, are excited to look more into this module. It is, it is an awesome module. Um, <laughs> Wolfpack is too sweet. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> your wife's getting fed up. I would too. As a first edition ad and DM, I would get up fed with you too. A Hamlet, if a Hamlet is a medium size, uh, yes, yes, it is. I know you, I know you're, you're kidding, Mercury, but, uh, yes. Ham is old English for home. And a Hamlet would be a small home. Ham, home. Yeah, this is not. This is not skeletal, but with the exception of like, you must play the NPC this way. I haven't seen any railroad tracks and that's easily just brush that aside. Just don't do it. If you give these NPCs to the party to play like a person at the table, like here, this is your character. Now let them run it how they want. That is that is just my my take on it. So we're we're going to be back into this uh, next Wednesday. We're going to look at this. Now I know a lot of you guys love the first edition AD and D game, um, but next Tuesday is my birthday. I, I'm on a live stream, but I'm I'm putting I'm putting my feet up. Uh, this is not one of my modules, Boone. This is actually Len Lakafka's uh, Secret of Bone Hill L1, which you should definitely check out. Uh, you can grab a copy on drive through get get a, a print copy done there. It's an awesome one. So yeah, next Tuesday is my birthday. Don't know that we'll play D&D, but I'm definitely, definitely going to, I'm going to put my feet up and I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to enjoy the birthday and chat with you guys, and we'll hang out and just do, I don't know. I don't know what we'll do. It'll be awesome. Don't know that we'll hit like we did uh, last year for my birthday, which happened just like the week of the Wizards of the Coast incredible screw-ups. So I think after I released those videos that at that time got like thousands and thousands and thousands of views in a day, um, th thank you, Mark. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that live stream, we, we had like 160 people, which for me is an insane number of people in the live chat. I could barely keep up with it. I had, uh, uh, Kyle was watching cause he has admin privileges on, uh, on, um, stream yard. And he's just like, he's messaging me. It's like, don't try and keep up with the streams. I will, you know, I'll keep an eye on it. You're, you're going to, you're going to be swamped, dude. So, but, uh, we will continue with this on Wednesday of next week. Uh, this Thursday, tomorrow night, as I said, Timothy M. Holt will be here. Author Timothy M. Holt will be here. We'll be talking about espionage in the Tom Clancy vein. Uh, so that should be pretty fun. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and what else? Let's see. Friday, we're going to be playing Gamma World on Friday. Monday, we'll be back. You know, maybe Monday. What do you got? What do you guys say to keep the deep dive rolling? Because this is a this is a, a meaty module. Uh, we'll do deep dive Monday too. So you guys, let me know if you want to do that, and we'll do that. So I do want to thank everybody for hanging out this evening. I really uh, super big thanks to Vaughn for the Alex Jones donation. Uh, I did enjoy that a lot and big, big ups to uncle Brat for the, uh, the $50 Superman. 
that uh, that really helps. I will get. Uh, <laughs> I should I should get that from YouTube in March, <laughs> which is not on you. <laughs> it's it's uh, that, that's that's not on you. Uh, but anyway, anyway, everyone, thank you all so very very much for coming by tonight. Um, and I really appreciate it, guys. I, I really, really do. And I'll see you all. Uh, I'll see you all tomorrow evening when we have special guest Timothy M. Holt here. Until then, everyone, peace. Be good to each other, and uh, don't gamble with the priests in in the Temple of Fortune. Peace. Have you seen my owl bear? to all the weirdos everywhere in the woods and in the air have you seen my owl bear should i shave off all my hair bobs are all around some live in tunnels underground some are fat some are rich some are sleeping in a ditch Ride a crooked horse without a saddle way off course. Naked as a toad, all the way to Smoky Joe's. Have you seen the little creep driving fast in his little green jeep? He smells like fish and brandy, but his rotten teeth look dandy. Take me to the show, I don't care if fast or slow. From action flicks to dancing dicks, just take me to the